Hey, it's Professor Grabowski, and in this video I'm going to offer some basic tips on photojournalism. Throughout our web journalism course, you'll be taking a lot of photos for our assignments. For example, you'll be taking photos for your weekly blog posts, and you'll need dozens of photos for your audio slideshow assignment, which is a form of storytelling that involves mixing sound with photographs to make a video. Now, I realize that some of you may own a fancy camera like a DSLR, and already have a lot of experience with photography. Maybe you've even gotten some of your photos published. For others, you may not have really given much thought to photography beyond snapping photos for your social media feed. But in this short video lecture, I'm going to cover some basics that everyone should be aware of. First, I'll talk about tips for taking good photos, and then I'll cover how to write photo captions, and how to edit photos, and finally I'll discuss some ethical issues to be aware of. My very first piece of advice is simple. Take your own photos. Journalism involves original storytelling, not copying and repackaging other people's work, like a book report. The same goes for photojournalism. You need to be taking your own photos for our class assignments. If you use someone else's photos, you're not providing any new content. You're not providing any sort of value. Moreover, you're likely violating copyright laws. The general rule for copyright is that if you didn't create a work, whether it's a news story, a photo, or some other creative work, you can't use it. It's not yours. You don't own it. Keep in mind that merely giving someone credit for their photo isn't sufficient. You can't just copy images from the web and acknowledge that someone else took the photo. That's still a copyright violation. And there are countless cases of amateur bloggers, student newspapers, and even major media outlets that have been successfully sued for thousands of dollars or more for using other people's photographs without their permission. So don't use any photos that you didn't take yourself. For our class assignments, you need to shoot your own photos and videos. Now let's talk about how to go about taking a good photo that you can use for your class assignments. First, focus on composition. Compose your photo before you shoot. If you don't have time to compose in the camera because you're afraid you'll miss your chance to get the photo, then take a wide shot so you have lots of leeway to crop the photo later on. Try to keep the composition simple. Try to focus on a single frame-filling center of interest. Generally have no more than two or three people in the photo, or no more than a few objects. Have a clean, contrasting background. Sometimes photojournalists call this the poster effect, and it works best for storytelling because you don't try to do too much with one image. Another important tip is to follow the rule of thirds. The natural inclination for the beginning photographer is to put the subject smack in the middle of a frame, but try to resist that urge. Instead, imagine a 3x3 three three grid laid over your image, and on certain cameras you can actually turn on the grid, then place your subject's head at one of the third's points, the parts of the 3x3 three three grid where the lines intersect. You'll have a much more dynamic image than if the subject was sitting in the center of the frame. Of course, in the heat of the moment, you may not always be able to get that perfect rule of thirds composition going. That's where the crop tool comes in handy. You can crop the image to meet the rule of thirds, and with the high-resolution images produced in today's cameras, you won't take a huge hit in quality. Another tip is to avoid bright lights or light sources in a photo because these can distract the viewer. What's the first thing your eyes are drawn to in the images on the screen? Those bright lights, right? This isn't the only case for bright lights, but brightly colored objects in your photos as well. How many times have you taken what you thought was the perfect photo of you and your friend only to see a tourist uh, with the hot pink shirt in the background. So when you're shooting, you have to be keenly aware of your surroundings. In the example on the screen, it's very easy to crop the lights out of the picture and still have a usable photo. But there are times where that's simply not enough. In many cases, you have to maneuver yourself out of the way of these light sources to make a picture. On the screen now is an example where your really only option is to, is to move. Another common error that can happen is backlighting. Ideally, you want your light source, whether it's the sun or a lamp, 
at your back so that it doesn't create a hot spot in your picture, or trick your camera's meter into underexposing the picture, which will make it too dark. See what I mean with the photo displayed on the screen? So what do you do to fix or avoid this? Well, you move around, move your subject around, find a spot where you can work with the light rather than having the light work against you. The sun can be your greatest friend or your worst enemy. So be cognizant of where light is coming from. Before you click the shutter, take a look at the light in the scene. Knowing the source, direction, and color of the light will help you predict what effect the light might have on your photo. Besides lighting, another thing to watch out for is objects that may ruin your photo's composition. Watch for things that appear to be growing out of people's heads when you shoot, such as poles. Always make sure you have the relevant body parts in the frame. So watch out for pole head and pole head's evil cousins, lamp head, microphone head, and windmill head. So what do you do when you're shooting and you encounter a foreign object growing out of someone's head? Well, it's simple. You change the angle you're shooting at. Even a slight step left or right in any of these situations with an appropriate reframing of the picture would have, kept, would have fixed this problem. On the note of controlling your background, another great analogy for composing your shots is to think of your photos as if you were a painter. You wouldn't paint a stray pole in the corner of a shot or growing out of someone's head, so why would you make a picture that way? My next tip is to shoot way more photos than you need to and shoot a variety of shots. The photographer of this picture on the screen took 110 shots before he got that one, which is the one he eventually published. The old rule used to be to shoot one roll of pictures, which was 24 photos. At a minimum, at any event you're asked to cover, even if it's just a speaker at a podium. Um, with the digital age, now that it's easy to, and inexpensive to take lots of photos and delete them, I would say you should go beyond that. Uh, that said, don't overdo it. No one has time to sort through 2,000 photos. When you shoot, don't just give yourself a few shots and move on. Work every angle. Shoot the same subject in every way possible. Zoom in, zoom out. Shoot a tight shot of a person's face, then shoot one where you can see their entire body. And oh yeah, don't forget you can turn the camera on the side for vertical shots. Those work too. While you're at it, don't forget the basics. Make sure you always get a wide shot of the scene in addition to a medium and tight shot. Always make sure you have a few different wide, medium, tight shots um, as the viewer needs context for what they're looking at. See the examples on the screen of a photo shoot at a university campus. And you can see some examples there of tight shots, medium shot, and a wide shot. Try to go beyond just settling for the cliche photo. How many photos have you seen of people, you know, talking on a phone or working on a computer or at a desk with books or shaking hands or making a layup at a, on a basketball hoop? There's always the obvious and the not so obvious photo. You should try to get both in every situation. Look around at the environment. Keep an eye out for interesting architecture or objects you can use to frame your shot. Look for things you can shoot through, such as fences, curtains, flowers, etc. All of these will help for more interesting composition. Speaking of interesting composition, don't forget everyone sees the world at eye level. So when you're shooting, look to give us something that you don't see every day. Get down low, stand on a chair, anything to help us see the world differently. Try to get access to places that others can't. People are used to seeing things at four to six feet in front of them. So try to get outside of that range. Get down on your subject's level for a more dynamic shot. Take that extra step and get that shot you don't see every day. Try to also be patient and wait for that decisive moment. You need to be willing to spend more than just a few minutes trying to get a photo. It's all about anticipation. Anticipate what's going to happen and get set up in the right location for that moment to hopefully happen. You see this all the time at football games where um, camera uh, photographers will just wait in the end zone, waiting for sort of that, that, that touchdown throw um, so they can capture it. And it might only happen once during the game, if at all. So sit there and wait for the right moment 
patience will go a long way to this end. It's probably going to take a lot longer than five minutes to make that perfect image. Another tip I highly recommend is to use a tripod. If you don't have a tripod with you, then use your body as a tripod by holding the camera firmly with both hands, leaning against the structure and taking a wide stance. And if you don't have your own tripod, keep in mind that um, our department actually uh, owns tripods and we lend them out. You can sign them out uh, by going to the equipment room and they'll let you take them out for uh, at least a day. My last tip for taking a photo is that rules are made to be broken. At the end of the day, what I've given you here is a set of basic guidelines to follow to get generally good photos. But that doesn't mean you should experiment, you shouldn't experiment on your own. And sometimes that experimentation means bending or breaking some of the rules I've just told you about. So go for it. Sometimes you will want that silhouette that you get from shooting into a light source. Sometimes a centered composition works. Don't feel limited by what I've just told you here. Feel empowered to know what works most of the time, but that some of the time it doesn't, and you should try something different. Finally, above all, don't forget that you're supposed to be having fun. The day photography ceases to be fun for you is the day you should probably go try something else. Now let's talk about what comes after you take the photo. First, don't forget to get information about what's going on in the photo. If you're going to use a photo in a publication or in a blog or as part of a video, your audience is going to need some information about that photo so they have context. So when you take a photo, always collect basic information such as who's in the photo, what are they doing, when was the photo taken, where was the photo taken. Remember, journalism is about people, not abstract art. So we need those basic five W's, who, what, when, where, why. So if there's a person in your photo, get their full name, both their first and their last name, and double check that you spelled it correctly. For example, if their name is Mark, is it spelled with a C or with a K or some other way? If there are a few people in the photo, get all of their names. Now, if there's an entire stadium or classroom of subjects, then you can probably get away without a name, but where you can, err on the side of getting names and identifying information. You should also write a caption for the photo. Captions are the text that appear next to the photo, usually below it. If the photo is just a headshot, you can simply state the person's name and the caption. Otherwise, write a complete sentence in the present tense. Say specifically in detail what the person is doing, but avoid stating the obvious. Captions should do more than just merely inform us of what's obviously going on in the photo. So for example, don't say John Smith shakes hands with President Biden on Sunday, September 3rd, 2023. That's not gonna tell us much. Why not tell us instead, why is John Smith shaking hands with the president? The last thing I wanna cover in this lecture is photo editing. And this is where ethics comes into play. There are many schools of thought when it comes to editing photos. Some media outlets don't allow any editing of a photo at all. But in journalism, generally a few minor adjustments are okay. And these kinds of adjustments are cropping, fixing exposure problems, and correcting color. We basically only permit these adjustments to the extent that they enable us to make our photo a more accurate representation of what actually happened, of what we actually saw. Remember, journalism involves reporting on reality. So if the shutter speed was slightly off, why should the audience see the world through your error? You can fix that, but keep in mind that there are limits to these edits. The key to remember here when you're editing photos is that you can only edit them in a way that depicts the world as accurately as you saw it, not the way the camera saw it or the way you'd like them to see it. Um, but you gotta make sure you don't cross the line and, and sort of depict um, it, something as better or worse than what you saw. So let me show you some examples on the screen here of what's okay and what's not okay. First, let's talk about cropping photos. If you didn't quite get the composition you wanted when you took your photo, maybe you got a little more than you wanted, well then it's okay to crop it, as the photo on the screen demonstrates. To crop, start with a tight crop around your center of interest in the photo, 
uh, your subject. Then grab one edge and pull it out until there ceases to be useful things that add information to the photo and stop there. Grab the other edges and then do the same. This helps keep dead space and unwanted artifacts to a minimum in your photo. Just make sure that you don't crop out any people or objects that can create a misleading impression of what happened. And on the screen here, you see an example of a misleading crop. And here is another example of a misleading crop. Those kinds of crops are unethical. It's also unethical to delete objects from photos. Even though your photo might look much better, if you just use a tool to delete a person or object that photobombed your perfect shot, you can't do that as a photo journalist. Now, if you want to do that with your family photos that you post on social media, well, that's different. That's fine. But as photojournalists, remember, it's our job to sort of depict reality as accurately as possible. So it's unethic, unethical for us to go and delete objects from photos um, because we're not portraying reality as it actually was. We're manipulating the photo. Next, let's talk about photo exposure problems. Sometimes shutter speed, meter, or lighting issues can cause a photo to look overexposed, uh, which means it's sort of overly white or blown out, as, or it can also cause um, underexposure, which is when the picture looks too dark. Now, sometimes this can be fixed with good Photoshop skills, and sometimes it can't. Again, the key is to fix it so that it resembles reality as close as possible but it's not okay to change it in a misleading way. So for example, you could conceivably take a photo at nighttime when it's pitch dark uh, and change the exposure in a way that makes it look like it's daytime, uh, but that would be unethical. Lastly, let's talk about color correction. Have you ever seen a photo come out too blue or too orange? Well, that's because cameras see light differently than humans do. Luckily, it's something that can also be fixed after the fact. Just be sure not to change colors in a misleading or an accurate way. A lot of travel influencers, for example, um, will manipulate their photos so that, you know, they look really perfect, right? So that the ocean water at the beach looks really blue. Um, but if you're a photojournalist, you shouldn't do that. Because remember, it's our duty to depict reality as accurately as possible, not to depict it in a way that makes it look prettier or as we'd like to see it. On the other hand, if you take a photo of a sports game and a red jersey ends up looking pink, it's okay to fix that jersey to make it look red because you know, you're only changing that photo so you can more accurately re represent what actually happened, what it reality actually looked like. Now beyond these three minor corrections that I just discussed, the cropping, the color correction, and the exposure issues, if you manipulate photos in any way beyond that, you should probably make a note of it. For example, in um, you know the caption or below the photo, you should state that it's a photo illustration or note what was changed. This way your audience won't feel deceived or misled and this way you won't get called out for, you know, posting uh, sort of a, a fabricated photo. Keep in mind that changing images in a way that shows something other than reality is a form of fabrication, which is considered a major journalism sin. Well, those are my basic tips for photojournalism. Uh, we'll cover this stuff more as the semester progresses, but of course, you can always ask me for advice if you have questions uh, about any of the issues that that came up in the meantime. Once again, this has been Professor Grabowski, and thanks for watching.